safely keeps us safe. Our neighbors will need us when the fire or hurricane comes. We, of course, will need them. We belong to each other. We must co-create our future together. The pandemic has shown us our interdependence. If my neighbor is sick, I am at risk too. If I do not care for myself, then my loved ones are more vulnerable. For our pathway forward, all of our labor is needed. Bridging will be necessary because the crisis will affect many of us across our differences. The problem is, system is systemic, involves interdependencies across borders and across sectors. So to solve it, we cannot take action in isolation. To design new systems, we need people who have been situated differently in the old systems. Refinery workers and fence line residents, farm workers and consumers, urban water users and rural watershed stewards. We must build these bridges to design regenerative systems. This also means bridges across types of knowledge. Solutions must come from collaborations of communities and scientists. We cannot deny science, nor can we isolate science from the wisdom of lived experience. Science must help design alternatives to fossil fuels so that communities from global south and north have viable solutions for a fossil fuel free economy. Yet communities must be trusted to govern these alternatives. So unanticipated harms do not go unaccounted for. We must reclaim our labor and put it towards the beautiful, fulfilling work of building in a, a belonging economy. <laughs> to restore the damaged systems and to build new living systems will require great labor from all of us. This is a good thing. The creativity and time of all of us is needed. We know that our connection to each other is what ultimately keeps us safe. Our neighbors will need us when a fire or hurricane comes and we will need them. So with all this being said, we see six essential types of solutions that will lead us on a pathway out of the climate crisis and toward justice and belonging. Firstly, we must act in global solidarity so we don't leave anyone behind. This means taking action across borders that follows the lead of communities hardest hit by climate disasters. We must build new systems for bioregions that are resilient and equitable. This includes renewable energy, infrastructure, watershed governance, green infrastructure, regional food systems, and so much more. We must rewrite rules and laws for climate justice. This includes legal status for climate refugees, transforming agriculture and food regulations, and rewrite, rewriting international trade agreements and national development plans. We must shift resources into a regenerative economy. This includes new mechanisms for public financing for climate resilience, green new deals, and shifting pensions and other funds out of the othering economy. We must block the expansion of and begin shifting down the existing fossil fuel economy. This means keeping oil in the ground, blocking new pipelines and shutting down and transitioning refineries. We must prepare and respond to disasters in real time with compassionate and effective solutions. This includes welcoming climate refugees, providing housing and essentials, and building community capacity to prepare for and respond to disasters. So this is the Other and Belonging Institute's framing of how to address the climate crisis and some of the solutions that we believe are needed to address the climate crisis and build resilience. And I'm very excited to hear the next speaker, Matteo, who's going to be speaking from Movement Generation and their framing on just transition and principles um, for the climate crisis or for climate justice. And I'll note that it very much aligns with what I just shared um, and was also a huge inspiration for our own principles and crafting them. So I'll pass it back to you, Sadik, and I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Masima, for uh, these uh, thoughtful remarks. And I will uh, give the floor to Matteo, one of the co-founder of Movement uh, Generation coming to us from Oakland, California. Take it away, Matteo. Thank you, Sadiq. Thank you, Vasima. Dearest family, querida familia, it's a, it's a true honor to be here in deep discussion with you all, 175 of us strong. That is very special. Um, and taking on such important and necessary questions. I greet you from, as, as a very fortunate guest of Wichin, 
unceded Ohlone land, also known as Berkeley, California and the San Francisco Bay Area. And I very much welcome the invitation uh, to really dig deeply and strategically into this question of how do we return to right relationship with each other and with the living systems that nourish us. We have this incredible fortune of being alive at a critical moment in history. And it is upon us to resolve these questions. And I have a lot of hope that 150 years from now, our descendants will look back and, and thank us for the difficult, critical, complicated, contradictory decisions that are upon us. So with your permission, I'm gonna share my screen and then head over to my PowerPoint and share some thoughts with you all. And I start with an incredibly vision, uh, an incredible visionary thinker, actor, Grace Lee Boggs, who for many, many years of her life kept on sharing incredible invitations on how to approach our work and our, our being on this planet. And she invited us to really inquire what time is it in the clock of the world? It's such an important and necessary question. And as Basima was already sharing with us, sorry, before, it's become clear that particularly in the last 150 years, we as a species have become a force of nature. The intensity and scale of what I'd call a globalized mismanagement of home has brought us to the brink. And in many ways, instability has become the new normal. So one of our key questions as a community, as we try to move from an othering economy to a belonging economy, as we try to move from a me mind to a we us economy, as we move from a banks and tanks economy to a sharing and caring economy, the question is, how do we do this in a constant context of growing instability? So what I'm proposing, and I, I believe we're all feeling in our bodies and in our communities and in our neighborhoods is, 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 you know, we know change is the new status quo. So the question is what will change look like? And transition is inevitable at this point, but justice is not. So the invitation to all of us is like, how do we make this a just transition? We have difficult choices. So how do we make them elegant and equitable? And even though all of us are feeling change as the new status quo. And I, since I live on the west coast of Turtle Island, you know, shattering heat records were but one expression of this change. We also know the, 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 the proportionality, the impact is very subjective and that class and race and gender really determine how strongly we feel the negative impacts of many of these changes going on. So I wanna introduce two frameworks and I wanna start with one that we call shocks, slides and shifts which we believe is a really useful way of trying to wrap our collective heads and more importantly, our collective action around how do we step into this instability in a way that we actually achieve the transformations that we so desire and need. So I will start by defining shocks. Shocks are acute moments of disruption. This is an image of Hurricane Maria. Shocks can also be financial market crashes. It could be the BP oil spill, um, but again, we're facing increasing amount of shocks, these acute moments of disruption. And they are not just ecological moments. There are communities that are feeling shocks on a continual basis. And what is harrowing about this slide, slide image is that these are images of folks that were murdered five, six, seven years ago, and we could substitute their images with many more unnecessary deaths. Then there is the concept of slides. And the distinction here is slides, they may not be an acute moment of disruption, but once they're set in motion, they can be very hard to stop. As you all can guess, this is a, a projected image of what New York would look like uh, due to sea level rise. But I also wanted to uh, give an example. Again, since I'm in California, the collapse, the eventual collapse of industrial agriculture in California is another slide. We're running out of water. Topsoil has been depleted. It's not gonna happen overnight, but at some point in the relative near future, what is the now called the breadbasket of the United States will no longer be so. So the point is, the more we ignore the slides, the more catastrophic they become. 
Drought is another example in the region that I live in. And again, this is an outdated image because this picture is about from the previous drought about five years ago. Now, if we had an actual one, it'd be all dark red and bright red. So another slide that may not seem acute, but can be catastrophic. And then we get into the zone of when shocks and slides meet, where the acute meets the chronic. And the mega wildfires we've been experiencing on the West Coast are an expression of these shocks and slides. Why am I naming these? Because when we have shocks and slides, especially the shocks are often moments where a veil is lifted and where we're all feeling more acutely, wow, something needs to change. But there are a multiple set of actors trying to define what change means, which gets me into the concept of shifts. If we have these mega wildfires and we have a police and prison industrial complex, then we end up with prison firefighters. More than a third of firefighters on the West Coast in recent years have been prison laborers. The point here being is that shocks and slides can be harnessed towards false solutions. So the question for us, if there are a set of false solutions in motion or on the table or false promises being made, what are the real solutions that we are organizing towards? That becomes the key question. And the Movement for Black Lives is an incredible expression of just that, of taking on a set of continual shocks and putting forth a bold reparations agenda and acting on it that shifts the debate completely in our political context. So shifts are the cultural and systemic changes we seek. So what I'm proposing is that we need to define those on our terms and build the collective muscle to get there. And there's a multiplicity of expressions of how this is happening in the Gulf South is one place where that uh, vibrancy is very present. And we have the good fortune of Joisha being with us, who will talk about that later today. So in one way I think about it is disaster capitalism is like the monster truck that is trying to drive us over the ravine of complete collapse. And what is our agenda of building just recovery and just transition campaigns? This is an image of I am, uh, as movement generation, we're a proud member of the Climate Justice Alliance. And this is an image of after Hurricane Maria hit, multiple delegations, since many of our member organizations worked the land, sent their community farmers in groups of 30 or 40 folks to spend weeks in Puerto Rico helping agroecology projects in that nation rebuild infrastructures since so much was destroyed. Just but one example of how we repair our relations going forth in the midst of instability. So how do we advance a regenerative economy? In very quick terms, I want to put forth one other framework to share with you, what we call the three circles strategy tool. What is this? Very often when we start organizing towards addressing an injustice or problem, we start by thinking within the bounds of what somebody else more often than I not defines for us as politically realistic. What if instead of doing that, we actually started the conversation by defining very clearly what is it that we actually need culturally and materially? And why don't we build towards that? You'll notice there are three circles. You'll notice that our agenda and false solutions never meet. They don't touch. You'll notice that the politically realistic circle is dotted. And the reason it's dotted is because it's it should not be defined by somebody else. It's actually very fluid and context matters. If, for example, we're trying to implement I, uh, you know, rent control as a, as a potential solution to uh, housing issues, that struggle will look very different in Seattle than Port Arthur because of the political context. I think you understand what I'm getting at. But most importantly, something is politically realistic as soon as we win it. And we don't know if we can win it until we try it. So let's say we're trying to build housing land trusts in a community. There may not be any, but as soon as we've built one, it's become politically realistic. The point here is to start from an ambitious posture that's rooted in what we truly need. And then I, in the interest of time, I won't get into this too much, but you'll notice five arrows pointing to five different distinct areas. So I, I just talked about creating. We need to create what we really need. Whether it's legal or not is inconsequential. What matters is, is it necessary? Is it ethical? Will it build our belonging muscle? 
That's what matters. And as soon as we win it, then we got to codify it and get legal mechanisms to recognize it. We need to oppose the false solutions that are already in existence, and we need to expose the ones that are being funded by billions of dollars of right-wing think tanking. And then we need to redefine governance on a whole new level. It's not a once every four years thing. It's an everyday thing, which we do uh, in our homes, in our schools, again. And I'll finish just by sharing a final story. This is Modesto Hernandez. When we talk about being ambitious, Modesto and four other farm workers in upstate Washington built a cooperative called Tierra y Libertad. It's a very growing cooperative that is now 200 workers strong. They pay themselves $15 an hour. They have 65 uh, acres of land. They are organic and pesticide free farmers, but most importantly, they intentionally operate as a sanctuary for undocumented immigrant workers. That, and they've organized the white folks that live around them to be, become part of this sanctuary. And they have tremendous vision for expansion. I'm sharing all this because this is but one of thousands of examples that are flourishing around us. That if we start from this place of not defining politically feasible by somebody else's terms, but by what we truly need, we get where we need to get. Another story I was going to tell, Arturo is here to tell us, but I'll finish with this. I invite us all to be realistic and to demand the impossible because we're running out of time and our children and their children's lives depend on it. Muy bien. Muchas gracias. Again, an honor to be here with you all. And El Sadig, I believe I hand it back to you. Don't stay silent for too long because I'll keep on storytelling. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Mateo, uh, for this wonderful uh, framing as well. Uh, now, um, I'm gonna move to the next part of uh, our uh, two-hour session, uh, which will include just a, a, a short um, a breakout session, bear bear. So we want you to also to share with each other and, 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 and to discuss what you heard so far and to share your uh, with the other person. So we're gonna divide you in break room. So please go to that break room and uh, we will get you back in um, uh, about 10 minutes. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanna also just uh, shout out to our uh, main speaker who will come next that they really join in us through a very huge lock time uh, that uh, uh, they come as far as from uh, East Asia and, and, uh, and Europe. So we appreciate you. So let me do that. Go to the breakout uh, rooms. Sorry for that. I somehow got thrown out of being able to check into my breakout room. Can I be reassigned, please? My name is Wendy, so sorry. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> I just need to create uh, enough rooms. Sierra, are you able Hi. to? Hi, um, yeah, so I'm actually creating the breakout room. So okay. um, yeah, I had them there, but I think you accidentally closed it, but I can start them up again. Just give me a minute, okay? Okay, please, thank you. I was not put in the breakout room. 
Yeah. Okay, give me one moment. Uh, somebody accidentally closed the breakout room, so they got kind of tossed around. So uh, I'm restart. I'm opening all the rooms again. Just give me one moment, okay? Can Thank you drop? You. What are the prompts? Hello, we are out in our breakout rooms, but are there prompts that we should be using or questions answering? Hi to everybody, if you can hear me, is yes, uh, uh, exchange a reflection of what, uh, what you did you heard and how that resonate with you in the issues related to climate. Uh, crisis uh, resolution and belonging. Great, thank you. Um, if someone's in charge of chat rooms, um, or I'm um, sorry, breakout rooms, would you mind putting me into breakout room 13? Oh, wait, never mind. I can do it myself. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm just joining and so missed the. Um missed the opportunity to hear the first part and I don't see a breakout room uh, option here yet. Oh, thank you much. All right, bye-bye.
Hi, Paul. Yes. Hi. I, are we in another breakout session? I don't know. Oh, sorry. I don't know. I, I, I think everybody is coming back now. So Sierra will let everybody back in the room. Thank the you. Room. I appreciate okay. it. Sorry about that. No, you're fine. Sierra, are uh, the rooms, uh, people are ready to come back? Yes, so I think the breakout rooms officially have closed, so everyone is now back on the main. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's always challenges as the technology. Uh, let's see. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, so sorry for that, for these challenges. Some of our screen went blank, so <laughs> we couldn't do anything about it. And thank you so much, uh, Sierra, for uh, stepping up and, 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 and help us to navigate the challenges. So now we're going to shift uh, course to our main speakers. As I mentioned earlier, we have uh, five brilliant of them, and they really coming to us from different parts of uh, the world and the US. Unfortunately, we're missing um, 
Taisha Monroe, an organizer with the line uh, three pipeline struggle. Uh, she just uh, working within her own organizing and mobilization and she cannot, uh, she wasn't able to join uh, as of now. But if she appear during the session, we'll bring her at the end. So in the order of speaking, we have uh, uh, Arturo Masadea is coming to us from Casa Pueblo in Puerto Rico. Arturo is the executive director of Casa Pueblo, a community-based group in Puerto Rico with 38 years of services in natural resources, conservation, education, and sustainable development. And after Arturo, uh, Hamza, uh, be ready, you will be next. Arturo, take it away. Arturo, your, your, your mic is a silence. Now, sorry about that. Oh, hola, buenas tardes. Eh, mi nombre es Arturo Masol. I'm from uh, Adjuntas, Puerto Rico, up in the mountains of the island of Puerto Rico. Uh, a very humble community, a coffee grown, uh, growing uh, area. Uh, Casa Pueblo is a community self-sufficient uh, organization. We have a lot of educational programs. We're managing state forest, Bosque del Pueblo, Bosque del Olimpia. We have a radio station, a solar cinema, uh, a school of music. We have built a school inside a forest, and, and this is what we do on, on a regular basis. We don't depend upon local government, neither federal funding uh, for our operation. Uh, in 1980, actually, we got organized because the government wanted to do open street mining. And when we learned about the mining, we decided that it was good for the companies and for them, but not for the local people. Uh, so we used knowledge to raise awareness around our community. And in our first uh, protest, we have only one person showing up. Uh, at that point, we realized that knowledge itself is not enough to promote uh, transformation in, in our community. And at that point, we embrace what we call our social equation for transformation, which is science, knowledge, scientific knowledge, traditional knowledge, knowledge, period, plus our culture and community to reach uh, to promote transformation. And this is the same main square 15 years after when policy changed uh, due to the advocacy of different communities and open street mining was uh, prohibited in Puerto Rico at that point. So we were celebrating at that point. Uh, a few years after we had a, another unsustainable project, a natural gas pipeline. And, and again, we use science, culture and community to understand the conflicts and the, and the problems. And we had at that point, uh, 30,000 people showing up, not just one. Now we know how to fight uh, these unsustainable proposals. And in our case, we, had, we were arrested in front of the White House. There's a colonial relationship. Uh, there's a political situation with Puerto Rico and the US that I guess we don't have time in, in, in five minutes. But the point is that Casa Pueblo is, is about uh, breaking a model of a model of dependencies, colonialism builds and 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 wins upon building dependency models. Uh, self determination, self decolonization is about breaking that model of dependency. We are economically self sufficient. We have education, radio and we have our own power. Since 1999, we have been promoting a bottom-up energy transformation in Puerto Rico to produce energy at the point of consumption. So you can see in, in, in your what uh, a, a, a left side, you can see uh, the initial solar panels we installed. We have upgraded through the years. We're producing much more, more energy that we are using for all of our operation. And when Hurricane Maria came through Puerto Rico in 2017, um, the, the hurricane is a natural event. 
but the disaster came because uh, the community was unprepared, the government, poverty, and other inequalities are, are you know, uh, put a lot of uh, pressure on our island. This is a summary of, of the power authority, a full power outage for month in some areas in our community for up to a year without power. Uh, 3,000 deaths related to, to that government disaster. 6% of the total population left. Uh, dependency upon alternative uh, source of power like power generators and all the consequences related to that. Uh, and not to talk about people who are now sick because of exposure to unhealthy food for a prolonged time. Uh, Casa Pueblo, because we're self-sufficient, the day after the hurricane, we were able to reopen and we became an energy oasis. The radio station for communication, we helped the community in different ways, but the first campaign was to light up at Juntas with solar lamps. And we were asking friends everywhere in the diaspora, we want solar lamps, no money, we want solar lamps. And it was a way to help people, 14,000 units were deployed uh, in our area and other municipalities. And it was a mean to educate people on how to yield solar power, in this case for, for illuminating their, their houses. At that point, we upgraded to help 10 homes with a small fridge for insulin and to run a, a special medical equipment. Uh, we installed like 55 solar fridges everywhere in the, in the rural parts to normalize uh, or to help uh, with the food insecurity that we were living at that point. Uh, at that point, we upgraded and helped other homes. And now there's like over 100 homes are running like Casa Pueblo fully on energy independence. Uh, as a mean for energy security, for health, also to deal with poverty as people are producing their own power, uh, climate adaptation and all the collateral benefits. Um, at that point, we decided to help local the local economy. This is the barbershop. Now we have a solar barbershop. And then we decided to power uh, critical infrastructure like grocery stores, the, 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 the fire station, uh, the emergency unit, uh, the, the radio station, uh, the, the, the warehouse, and even we built a solar cinema. Uh, we're showing movies for free. We even showed free solo when we were celebrating our first anniversary of the solar cinema. It was a disaster because Alex Hono was sitting in the middle of the, of the cinema, so we knew that he didn't felt out of that rock, so the ending was the end of the movie was spoiled, but he was there because we were marching, we were protesting now, not for, to oppose to the mining, but to propose a, an alternative energy future. And now we're building at Juntas Pueblo Solar. It was proposed, it was designed, we organized the community and it has been built since 2019. Uh, the power that is gonna supply the highest energy demand in the community is gonna generate wealth within the community and that money will be used for social reinvestment to help low income families reach energy uh, security as well. Um, so this is sort of in downtown and juntas, we have the, the foot, footprint is much broader, but this is how adjuntas look like right now. And the energy landscape is being changed from the bottom up. We even have a, a, a newspaper celebrating how we are accomplishing these changes. We are organizing the community with uh, other in and belonging institute in a different fashion. But the point is that we have to consensus. We need to decolonize Puerto Rico. And one way to do it beside political discussion is to build energy independence by building energy independence, regardless of the political future, statehood independence, Puerto Rico will be in a better position to make a decision. So thank you. Uh, and I think uh, time is over. Thank you so much, Antoro. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, you racing against time and as Oh, all of the many speakers, but we are really just blessed to have you all here. And I will uh, open the next space for Hamza uh, Hamushan, 
He is a, a London-based Algerian researcher, activist, and a commentator with the Transnational Institute, and is a founding member of Algeria Solidarity Campaign and Environmental Justice North Africa. Uh, Hamza, take it away. And um, please, for the speaker, uh, can you speak just slowly for the interpreter? And just keep it on seven minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Asadik, for the introductions. I'm really glad to be here. And I'm, usually, I'm a slow speaker. So I hope the interpreters uh, won't struggle with me. Um, first of all, I'd like to start by saying that the current pandemic, which is part of the global multidimensional crisis we are going through, demonstrates that we are living now. What we are living now is a taste of worse things to come if we don't take the necessary measures to implement just solutions to the unfolding climate crisis. A robust and radical vision of just transition sees environmental destruction, capitalist extraction, imperialist violence, inequality, exploitation and marginalization along the axis of race, class and gender. And as simultaneous effect of one global system which must be transformed. Basically, solutions which try to address one single dimension, such as environmental catastrophe, in isolation from the social, cultural, and economic structures that give rise to it will inevitably remain false solutions. Let's go to North Africa now. The Sahara there is usually described as vast, as a vast empty land, representing an Eldorado of renewable energy and constituting a golden opportunity to provide Europe with energy so it can continue its, its extravagant consumerist lifestyle and excessive energy consumption. However, this deceptive narrative overlooks questions of ownership and sovereignty and masks ongoing global relations of domination that facilitate the plunder of resources, the privatizations of commons, and the dispossession of communities consolidating therefore and democratic and exclusionary ways of governing the transition. Several examples from North Africa region show how energy colonialism is reproduced even in transitions to renewable energy in the form of what is called green colonialism or green grabbing. Let's talk about Morocco and its bogus energy transition where people have no say in what is being done. The Warzazet solar plant, for example, launched in 2016, has failed to bring any semblance of justice to the Amazir agro-pastoralist communities whose lands were used without their consent to install a 3,000 hectares facility. Add to this the debt of $9 billion from the World Bank, European Investment Bank, and others, a debt that is backed by Moroccan government guarantees, which means potentially more public debt for a country already overburdened with debts. Finally, the project is using concentrated thermal power, what is called CSP, that necessitates extensive use of water in order to cool down and clean the panels. In a semi-arid region, like Warzaza, diverting water use from drinking and agriculture is just criminal. And we mustn't forget, of course, Morocco's occupation of Western Sahara. While some of the projects in Morocco, like the Warzaza solar plant I just mentioned, can be described as green grabbing, similar renewable projects that are taking place in the occupied territories of Western Sahara can be simply labeled green colonialism as they are carried out in spite of the Sahrawis and on their occupied land. These renewable projects are being used to entrench the occupation by deepening Morocco's ties to the occupied territories with the obvious complicity of foreign capital and companies. Same goes for Tunur solar project in Tunisia. It is a private venture between British, Maltese, and Tunisian entrepreneurs aiming to develop 
a series of projects that will deliver low cost dispatchable power to Europe. Once again, the same relations of extraction and same practices of land grabbing are maintained while Tunisians are not even self-sufficient in energy. These big renewable projects, while proclaiming their good intentions, end up sugarcoating brutal exploitation and robbery. It seems that a familiar colonial scheme is being rolled in front of our eyes. The unrestricted flow of cheap natural resources, including solar energy from the global south to the rich north, while fortress Europe builds walls and fences to prevent human beings from reaching its shores. While certain Western governments portray themselves as pro-environment by banning fracking within their borders and setting carbon emission reduction targets, they go and offer diplomatic support to their multinationals to exploit shell resources in, other former, in their other former colonies. Something that France did with Total in Algeria. If that's not energy colonialism or environmental racism, I don't know what it is. We cannot allow for neo-colonial relations to be extended and consolidated in some projects being concocted, for example, by the European Union that would like Africa to produce and export green hydrogen to Europe. The EU's hydrogen strategy in the framework of the European Green Deal is an ambitious roadmap for shifting towards green hydrogen by 2050. It proposes that the EU could meet some of its future supply from Africa, in particular, the northern part. The Desert Tech project also goes in this direction and even pushes for the use of the current gas pipeline infrastructure to export the hydrogen from North Africa. Basically, it advocates for a mere switch of the energy source while maintaining the existing authoritarian political dynamics and leaving intact the hierarchies of the neo-colonial international order. Moreover, the Desertec Manifesto points out that in an initial phase, the substantial hydrogen volume can be produced by converting natural gas to hydrogen. And, and the subsequent CO2 emissions that are generated can be stored in empty gas oil fields in Northern Africa, like my home country, Algeria. For me, this alongside the use of the rare water resources to produce hydrogen can be considered as yet another example of dumping waste in the global south and displacing environmental costs from the north to the south. A just transition must be under the control of the communities and their democratically elected representatives. It cannot be left to the private sector and companies. This would need huge public investments in renewable energy, public transport, diversifying the economies away from fossil fuels to sustainable agriculture and other sustainable sectors. This also necessitates technology transfer. We need to question the intellectual property regimes, the global intellectual property regimes that are governing the global trade system. Uh, a regime that showed its limits and its murderous intentions through the um, vaccine apartheid that we are living through. Um, that just transition also necessitates the cancellation of southern countries' debts, necessitate tax justice and the halt of capital flight from Africa, for example. Most of the funding, in my view, must come from the global north, who is responsible, historically responsible, for causing the climate crisis. What we call the ecological debts and climate reparations must be paid to countries in the global south. These are just a few reflections that I wanted to share with you um, to deepen our conversation around the issue. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Hamza. This is wonderful uh, 
uh, kind of uh, giving us a, an overview of what's going on in North Africa. And we uh, will join you and others, shout out to the uh, people who struggle in, in, in the Sahrawi people in, in Western Sahara. So next uh, speaker, we will have Joisha Dota from Another Gulf is Possible of Louisiana and the Gulf Coast region in the United States. Joisha is a Bengali water protecting mermaid and artist born in a mobile, raised in New York, aged in Auckland, who now loves calling New Orleans home. Joisha, please take it away. And the next speaker will be Weldon. And please keep it to seven minutes. And if you can speak slowly for the interpreter. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Elsa Day. Thank you, Othering and Belonging Institute, for having me today. Um, my presentation is going to be a little bit different than probably uh, our other speakers today. Again, my name is Joisha. I go by she, her, hers. I am, um, like Elsa Dick said, a Bengali water protecting mermaid. I uh, live in New Orleans, also known as Balbancha. I was born in Mobile, Alabama, which is about less than 150 miles from the place I live um, and call home. And my ancestors are from Bengal. And I think it is no coincidence for me personally that the place my ancestors are from and the place that I was born and the place that I call home are all um, are both uh, mirrors of each other on this planet. And they are um, suffering from climate catastrophe, from coastal land loss, from ongoing disasters, hurricanes, monsoons. And so, you know, in this moment, I do want to call in my ancestors. I come from a line of, of many amazing ancestors. My, my grandfather was a um, a revolutionary freedom fighter for Bangladesh's independence. Um, and in this conversation about othering and belonging, I do want to bring in, you know, how this, um, the relational aspects of, of the work. And so in that, I Jane, want to- I just muted. Oh, sorry, can you hear me now? I want to bring in my other collaborators from Another Gulf is Possible. I won't speak to all of them, but just so you can see us um, in this constellation of relationship that we are in. There are uh, 11 of us members from Brownsville, Texas. And now that I'm splitting my time with uh, New Orleans and South Florida to down here, South Florida, across Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, and Florida, we are a collective that is really trying to be rooted in an ecosystem of accountable relationships in the Gulf South, in this historical context of extraction from our region, um, but really rooting ourselves in art and culture as our kind of method and way that we're looking to transform, um, heal, and build this just transition. We see ourselves as intersectional, interdisciplinary, translocal, and we are building power for the long haul. This is not something that is a flash in the pan, even though we find ourselves constantly getting into the news when there is a disaster, but this is long-term work. Like Mateo was talking about, we're gonna keep having these shocks, but it's the shift that we are really about in our collective. Uh, we are looking for intergenerational building and we see ourselves having growing edges. And this is not just for ourselves, but for our whole movement around transformative justice, around all the harms and traumas that happen in these really high stress, high stakes uh, moments of resistance that we have to focus on our, our own relationships with ourselves and with each other. And that's a theme you'll continue to see in, in my presentation about art, culture, and healing. You know, we are committed to direct action from front lines to flood lines. A lot of the most visible work that you will see from another Gulf has, has been in these giant mass actions. But we also, again, believe behind the scenes work, the work of healing is also really important. We see artists as first responders, that storytelling is a way for us to survive, has been a way for us to survive for generations upon generations upon generations. And that that is the, the legacy upon we build the just recovery work that we have found ourselves in due to necessity. 
And so, you know, as we face climate disaster after climate disaster after climate disaster, how do we shift from this aid, extract, displace model that we are so accustomed to seeing to a respond, recover, and rebuild model? And I will say in this moment, in the response to Hurricane Ida, we are actually seeing, I am seeing in my communities in the place, you know, a sh there is a shift. There is more mutual aid and part of it is the pandemic, but there is, there has been a shift in some of the things that are happening even right now as we speak, the Bayou communities, you know, that were really hard hit. Th there are some differences happening. So I would argue that these changes are slowly starting to manifest because we know that just, you know, just recovery is just transition, that fires, floods, hurricanes, tsunamis, tornadoes, they impact our energy systems, our food systems, our water, our transportation, our health, our goods and services. All of these are impacted when we see big disasters happen. So these are the moments we can start to manifest these solutions we wanna see. And really the, the take home for, for me, from my presentation is how do we center healing in just recovery and just transition. And I'm not gonna speak too much about this because this could take my whole presentation, but in August of 2019, I went to Palestine. <coughs> a whole heart was broken open. I was in a state of shock and disbelief at the inequality that I was seeing in front of my eyes. I took every day while I was on a delegation with Eyewitness Palestine, which is actually how I got invited into this circle, um, this connection from, from being on the board there now. But I, I took time to, to paint every day, every night, and process what I was seeing. I then went to uh, the Ayahuasca <laughs> Haram in Istanbul on my way back. And in that moment between the painting and processing and the, the washing away of, of some of the stress that I had felt in, embodied in my body, I just really realized what I needed to see. I went on a residency, um, took three weeks, to further process, to again, use art, be with the water, be with nature. And my father then fell in Puerto Rico on my 11th trip to the island. It was to be my first trip um, as a pleasure trip. My father fell, he broke his pelvic mm -hmm. bone, couldn't sit. That three day trip turned into a five week nightmare. Um, and I, I really realized seeing that from all that experience from August until November of that year. And then the pandemic happened, right? Like I am really clear where I'm at and I'm gonna share a 30 second video with you of like where I am in my journey. My vision for the Marbari sparked while gazing up at a stained glass mandala in the giant dome of a 500 year old bathhouse in Istanbul. In that moment, I felt deep in my bones and saw in my mind's eye the Marbari, a place to heal globally and be locally. The Marbari bath art and tea house provides elemental healing, hydrotherapy services, space for creative expression, and ancestral plant medicine to cultivate community wellness and center individual well-being. And so I would argue that how we get into balance with ourselves, with our people, with our planet, how do we create more joy, abundance, care, and well-being individually and collectively? If we can answer these questions, I, I don't believe all the statistics and graphs or anything in the world, if we can answer these questions for ourselves, for our communities, for our people, I believe that those are our solutions. Thank you. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gaisha, for uh, this wonderful sharing. Uh, and uh, I will direct people just to uh, to go to the another call if it's possible to see the awesome work they, they are doing over there. Uh, our next speaker, uh, we are really blessed to, to have him with us, is Weldon Bello is the co-founder and co-chair of the ba uh, Bangkok-based Institute of Focus on the Global South. 
Weldon is a Filipino academic environmentalist and activist who served as a member of the House of Representatives of the Philippines from 2009 to 2016. He is currently the International Agent Professor of Sociology at Binghamton University uh, in New York and a retired Professor of Sociology and Public Administration at the University of Philippines, Delman. It's such a pleasure to have you with us and we appreciate you join us despite uh, the lack of long time. Take it away, well done. Thank you, uh, Elsdig, and thank you for uh, inviting me to share uh, this, my, some of my thoughts. I uh, would apologize for uh, not having a, a PowerPoint. It's just that uh, being so constantly on Zoom these days, uh, it's becoming difficult to prepare PowerPoints for all sorts of presentations. But I would like to address the question of um, uh, climate and refugees, the question of agriculture and climate. And the third one is thir trade and climate. Um, uh, first of all, uh, when we come to Refugees, I think it is fairly well documented now that um, climate refugees are a very significant um, uh, um, stream uh, of migration uh, from south to south and from south to north. Okay. Uh, and uh, however, um, the way you know, states uh, deal with uh, this new phenomenon uh, is uh, is is take is is really in a very backward fashion. Uh, when people talk about refugees, states usually classify uh, refugees into two: uh, political and economic refugees, uh, and. You know, this of course misses the whole aspect of uh, migration created by climate change. Now, the question, therefore, is: Is the solution to create a third category of climate refugees? I don't think this is the case because increasingly, climate. Uh, uh, um, politics and economic factors are combining to, uh, in fact, create these streams of migration so that it is really impossible to try to abstract, to, you know, to concretely differentiate people into you're this, you're this, you're that. Uh, and um, so, uh, you know, we, 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 um, we, you see, for instance, um, uh, in in the case of the European Union and uh, climate refugees, um, what we see is that most, I mean, a great many of the people who are practically imprisoned in Libya because the EU, uh, you know, has um, basically. Um, um, given uh, its uh, uh, refugee policy uh, to be implemented by, you know, the Libyan uh, government, which is, you know, you know, um, uh, uh, currently a failed state. Okay. Um, we see this, this, this problem, uh, you know, so, you know, so this is, this is big crisis. We also see this now with respect to what's been happening in the US-Mexico border recently. The US under the Biden administration has been flying back um, Haitian uh, refugees back to Haiti. And again, you know, so many of the, the uh, refugees are climate refugees because of the tremendous crisis created by uh, climate change and uh, you know with, with tremendous impact on, um, on Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, and, but I think that what we're seeing here is really a 
uh, you know, a very bankrupt uh, refugee policy that needs, you know, a total um, transformation um, because all aspects of it, whether it's dealing with economic question, the political question, the climate question, it is really nothing else but, you know, repressive policies, whether it's in the EU at this point in time or in the United States, but of course, not just with those two um, uh, areas. Now, when it comes to um, food security, food policy, um, what we're seeing, um, uh, you know, over the last few years have been millions and millions of hectares of land throughout the world, in Africa, in, um, uh, in other uh, places in South Asia, um, that have been subjected to land grabbing. And, um, you know, this, this, this um, land grabbing has um, meant the transformation of food subsistence agriculture by smallholders, um, you know, using, you know, uh, climate friendly um, um, technology. Um, uh, and the transformation to large scale industrial agriculture, uh, monocrops, uh, and this technology is highly carbon intensive. So what we're basically seeing now, you know, is the replacement in so many areas of the world through land grabbing and industrial agriculture uh, of small scale indigenous technologies that are climate friendly by climate destructive um, industrial agricultural technology. Um, and, and so, Again, we see the interconnections between the social, the economic land grabbing, uh, and the technological. And here, in my sense, is that when we talk about policies to address these issues, uh, we really need, you know, um, the re relocalization um, uh, of agriculture. We need to bring agriculture back to small scale and to relocalize this so that technology and production is under the control of smallholders that are practicing uh, climate friendly policies. So relocalization is really very key at this point to address this interrelated problem of land grabbing, cash cropping, and um, carbon intensive technologies. Um, finally, uh, to uh, the question of trade. Uh, well, um, um, it, so much of trade now is being conducted, uh, you know, is, is organized around global supply chains. And um, what, what is very clear at this point is you know because of you know the phenomenon of global supply chains, uh, so much of the global north is outsourcing its production and therefore its climate destructive activities to the global south. So that usually in the accounting that takes place, um, uh, you know, for you know for for climate dis destructiveness, what passes for carbon emissions in the global south countries uh, uh, really are due to the export, you know, of production facilities to the global south in order to be able to re-export those to the global north. So uh, this, this phenomenon, therefore, of, um, of what we see as um, um, this uh, supply chains, you know, um, is very destructive uh, at that level, um, uh, and you know, and and really, um, you know, also very destructive is the fact that they are so transportation and carbon intensive, you know, that are taking place uh, at this point in time. So this whole corporate-driven phenomenon of Global supply chains um, has been an, a uh, you know a, a great contributor to uh, uh, you know intensified carbon emissions 
and uh, it has deepened uh, the north-south divide in so many different ways, including the export of carbon emissions from the north to the south. So again, and I would just like to say here that the solution lies in different areas. Uh, one, uh, for instance, the global north really, you know, degrowth. Um, that that is that that is a necessity for all global north societies at this point. Uh, which would mean a tremendous reduction in consumption, um, you know, because it is really historically it's been the global north that has been damaging the climate um, it, uh, it's very significantly. Uh, the second thing that, uh, of course, would would be important is, uh, uh, you know, you know, gro the global green new deal, you know. Um, and of course, uh, principally, the funding for that um, and the leadership in that, um, uh, you know, uh, should be taking place in 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 the north. Um, um, and um, but to make sure that it is internationally conceived, so that the global south is not left behind, and you have a green fortress Europe and a green fortress America, which is a tremendous. Temptation, um, and you know, and could you know that that kind of you know uh, that kind of linking of a fortress, green fortress, with fascist politics. I think we should really, really, really keep that in mind. That that is a very great danger. And then finally, I think we really need to get rid of these free trade agreements, this economic partnership agreements the wto you know which just promote this um uh promotes this um um you know this um bringing down tariffs bringing down quotas you know destroying local economies and not only that but they encourage you know this carbon intensive methods of transportation and production, you know, you know, and 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 so, you know, one of the greatest enemies uh, of the climate is really the free trade mentality, the 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 the, the these free trade agreements, you know, uh, and again, um, what we really need at this point uh, is we really need to relocalize. We have had enough of this creation of global supply chains. Uh, you know, and we really need to put production uh, in the hands of smaller units that, you know, will focus on much less carbon intensive uh, uh, production and in real fact, will have incentives to go more green uh, at this point in time. So these are uh, just a set of considerations that I propose that we really need to look at when we deal with climates and refugees climate and trade and climate and agriculture. And thanks a lot for inviting me to share some of these thoughts uh, with you today. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Wildan Bello. This is, uh, you give us a lot, a lot to uh, contemplate on. Uh, now, um, I, I will hand it to my colleague, Eli Moore, to lead us in a, a small group discussion and other final part of our conversation today is we will bring back the whole panelists together. Eli, please take it, take it away. Thank you, Osade. Hello, everyone. We're going to take uh, about five minutes in small groups for some discussion, and I'll post some prompts and send you into your rooms. Let us know if you have <coughs> any issues. The prompts are, what are the principles and strategies presented today illuminate about the pathways that could be taken in your region, in your networks? And what would a belonging economy look like in your bioregion? What new systems would come to life?
Hi, Eli. Did you create these uh, breakout rooms? Yes, it looks like the 15 people who joined more recently aren't assigned, so we'll, um, I'll put yeah. you in the rooms. Sorry. So I'm gonna, no, you're totally fine. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close these rooms, everybody, uh, and I'm just going to open it up so everyone uh, can get assigned to uh, like an even amount of people in the room. Is that okay? Or do you want to just keep them? Uh, let's just keep them because they were the same rooms people had, and I'll just send these 15 into. Uh, rooms. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. So if you're still here in the main room, you, you should have seen a pop-up um, that's inviting you to a breakout discussion. Yeah, Eli, I just sent you a direct message. I uh, immediately clicked on it, we sat in it alone for quite some time, and then I was in room nine, and then I came back here and uh, thought I would see if you guys could redirect me to where there's actual people. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Um, sending you back. There's somebody there now. All right. I was in room 14 alone for a long time too, so I came back. <laughs> there and should be three people in room 14 now. Okay. Uh, so Rick, it looks like you have to rejoin the room on your own. Do you right, see that? I'm I'm not seeing where I would do that. I'm not see, uh So if you're alone in a room right now, just go ahead and exit out of the breakout room and I will reassign you into <clears throat> a room that has people in it. Is that okay? Uh, please do. Uh, yeah, I'm in, I'm in the main room right now and I was okay. in nine, but I'm not seeing any place to uh, click back on it. So you can- okay. either just reassign me to nine or reassign me to whatever room you'd like. Yeah, I'm going to reassign you to um, something that'll have other people. So just give me one moment. Sure. Thank you. And Eli, whenever you're ready, just let me know when you want to close out the breakout room. Okay, thanks. We'll take a few more minutes because people have just been joining.
Hello. Hello. Hi, I don't know what happened. I was in the waiting room for group 30. And then all of a sudden I was switched to group 30. And then, I, I, you know, I don't know what's going on here, but I just, um, it popped me back out. So um, I'm not sure, it said group 30, but I never did get in it until um, wait, you know, like a minute ago. So, I'm so just, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. You know, it's, we, we're trying to stick with the, you know, the times and technology, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's challenging. I think we're going to go ahead and close the discussion rooms. Yeah. Well, I just want to say that I'm like, um, I hadn't heard of this conference. And when I saw it, I, I immediately wanted to be a part of it. So I'm glad that I'm here and I'm learning a lot. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. Welcome back, everyone. Sorry for the difficulties with the breakout discussions. Um, thank you for your patience, flexibility. The technology isn't always easy, and um, but we are grateful that we can connect across borders and geographies. So we're gonna um, have a discussion with the main speakers now, um, with Arturo, Walden, Joisha, and Hamza. And um, we'll take questions in the chat if you'd like to pose questions. And I wanted to kick it off with a, um, and Mateo, sorry. Um, and I wanted to kick it off with this question of building the bigger we and the bridges. Uh, the theme of this conference is around bridging and the risk and imperative of bridging across differences and wanted to hear your thoughts on how you see that happening, what it looks like, and, and what it takes in, in your experience. Is there anybody who would like to begin responding to that? And speaking of building bridges, right? Is that what you want us to know how we build bridges and other within communities, how to do this? Is that what you're saying, Eli? Yes, I'm, I'm, at, I'm asking the, the presenters um, if they could share thoughts on that, that question for right now. Um, oh, okay, okay, I can understand that, okay. Thank you. Um, I mean, I'm happy to kick things off. Um, like as I shared in, in my presentation, I'm a big believer in art making and the creation of art and creative process as a way of building and bringing people together. And I think the reason for me that I believe that is that in order to bridge, build bridges, you have to build trust. And um, I think one of the ways that you can build trust is to engage in collaborative creative process together and playing together. And that those are things we don't actually do enough, particularly as adults. Um, and in this question of othering and belonging, the way to create belonging, in my perspective, is to create open, uh, you know, creative, inspiring space that encourages people to be them best, their best selves. And that oftentimes the spaces we create are tense, divisive and they lead to further division as opposed to the bridges. And so my, my, my sincere assertion is for those of us who do this kinds of change work to really attune and pay attention to creating space that feels um, healing, that feels creative, that feels inspiring, um, because I do believe that'll inspire us to be better and that'll inspire us to have better bridges to each other. 
I'm happy to build off what Jerisha shared. <clears throat> we often talk about the importance of frontline communities leading. And yeah. as we think through the interlocking ecological crisis that we're all up against, one way to think about it is we all have the challenge to find our front line. This crisis is impacting everyone. And once we find that front line, how do we act in deep solidarity with all other efforts and process. You know, one of the concepts that we often hear from a more mainstream environmental perspective in the US is that we have to lower our footprint as a species. And we'd argue it's actually the opposite. We have to increase our footprint like never before, but towards a completely different purpose in full symbiotic relationship with living systems on the planet. Arturo was giving us an example of that. You know, we have so much concrete to tear out to rebuild agricultural fields so that we can feed folks in a regenerative way. There are so many oil caps that need to be capped. You know, the, the work is endless and that's our gift as humans. So how do we reclaim our labor and break free from the chains in the market and return that labor into the web of life is something we all can do. And, 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 and figuring out how to do it in a sharing and caring way is something we all can explore. So the invitation, I think, is rather simple in some ways. What is the exploration we're engaging in? And then how do we lock it in, into a web of solidarity with all of the other expressions happening at the, all around us? Eli, can I, can I have a go as well? Um, I'll try to be brief. For me, just in response to what you said, any just transition or any forms or any kind of a Green New Deal or any transformation towards renewables needs to be global. So it cannot be just localized. It needs to undo historical systems of oppression. That's why you always talk about colonialism and your colonialism. So we need to decolonize the energy systems right now. We need to decolonize you know, the capitalist system. We need to undo the, exploit the ongoing exploitation. So we cannot just ha have a Green New Deal in the US or in Europe while forgetting what's happening outside. Because usually what happens is an externalization of social and economic costs from the North to the South. We can, we can have a, a green system, uh, we can have green colonialism by maintaining you know, the same kind of uh, patterns of exploitations and hierarchies of domination. So that's one point. The second point is that we need to build solidarities and alliances through the urban rural spectrum. I, I don't call it urban rural divide. It needs to be an urban rural spectrum that will bring different sections of society, different constituencies together from small scale farmers, pastoralists, unemployed people, informal workers, women, racialized groups, and so on. So we need to, to start building those alliances, as well as the working classes, the workers in those destructive industries like the fossil fuels. So an example, like in my home country, Algeria, where most of the income comes from oil and gas, we cannot have a transition towards renewable without involving the workers in the oil and gas industry. But at the heart of all of this is the question of democratization. We need to continue democratizing our systems. And that's a long-term process. Uh, if I may just um, uh, add some thoughts that have been provoked by the different presentations, which I have found extremely informative. Um, um, uh, I, I think that, uh, Civil society is, you know, has the critical role to play, uh, and um, I think that uh, if we look at, for instance, refugee policy, you know, um, it was, you know, concern of civil society, you know, a concern about values that uh, prompted the. Um, uh, Democratic Party to say it was going to take a different 
policy towards the refugees, especially those coming from the, the South. Um, and um, so uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's what made people think that there was going to be an entirely new approach to, you know, um, migration. Um, and um, what we have seen, though, is that um, in the last few months, um, you know, it's it's gone back in many ways to uh, Trump era policies when it comes to uh, you know this migration, and nowhere has that been clearly outlined than in the recent you know sort of forced airlifts of migrants back to Haiti. And, you know, and, and I think the lesson is this, that um, um, we really need to, um, you know, radically organize civil society across borders, uh, because if we don't, uh, states and corporations left to themselves and without pressure, tend to go back to the same old ways, you know, uh, and, and the dynamics of, of, of going back uh, to the same old ways, uh, you know, whether you're a democratic president or a Republican president is, is really so um, it, it tempting. So, uh, um, and I guess this goes for all other issues that uh, somehow the, the um, we've made progress in terms of um, international civil society cooperation um, um, during the 2000s we had the anti-globalization movement that was made a lot of very strong um, cross-border um, organizing um, but um, but in the last few years, th that has, you know, sort of declined. And um, I think it is extremely important for that, um, for this sort of um, trans-border organizing again, to really, really um, uh, get back the spirit that we had with the, the, uh, 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 the um, anti-globalization and then the Occupy movement, you know, that made significant advances. So, um, so I, 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 that would be my one um, thing that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking at this point that uh, we really can't trust the state, okay? If you leave the state itself, they're going to get back to the same old ways and even more so corporations. So uh, how do we, uh, you know, organize? Uh, we really should put a lot of thinking to this trans-border organizing because, uh, you know, if we, if we sort of lean back, become complacent, we begin to see the same old processes, you know, um, you know happening. So uh, I think you, you, you made the point uh, Hamza about capitalism has capitalism has so centrally organized you know the world at this point in time across borders you know and 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 here we are uh, we haven't been able to match that that kind of I hate to use the word centralizing the activities because centralization sometimes connotes a bad thing but cooperation um, and it, I think we have no choice but to just get that process of cooperation across borders together because the centralizing dynamic of capitalism is so great. And if you don't control it, um, and we can't leave it up to the state to control it, we can't even leave it up to the Na United Nations to control it. We've seen how the climate negotiations have been going. <laughs> you know. So anyway, uh, maybe raising more uh, problems than solutions here, but I think we need to confront this problem. Thank you, Walden. There's a great question here that in the chat that 
from Sonrisa Lucero. How do we navigate the urgency of the climate crisis and the need to slow down, to listen, build relationships, move at the speed of trust? Can you help us with that kind of contradiction? Let me show you how. <laughs> Joyce, I, I think that you you're laying yeah, out. I have, have a lot of thoughts, but I also approach. I also let off last time, so I just want to be careful to not just be the one to speak first each time. Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll, I think I'll just say uh, again, I, I just gonna complete, I really feel like we as society really complexify things more than we need to sometimes, which actually I believe is part of our solution is to simplify and to come, and I think the pandemic did allow for a, a, a slowdown for all of us to slow down and now I think we all feel it in our bodies, how much things have accelerated. I can speak to my calendar in October and, and how much I feel like we're, I'm back at 2019 somehow in terms of like how fast things are moving again. So I feel like, um, I think it's up to us and in our own individual ways in, in certain regards to, to slow down our inside clocks and our inside feelings of urgency because that will then translate into how we are interacting with those we work with, right? And so I, I think there's, there's the individual, collective, and systemic, and we, we do have control over our individual bodies. And I think there's this thing about embodiment and somatic practice that intersects um, in ways that are, again, I think outside the realm of facts and figures and policy, which I think a lot of the climate conversation always, always goes to, and so I, again, just really emphasize and ask for those of us in these conversations, even when you're starting a meeting that might be all facts and figures, to take a moment to ground, to do a few breaths, to do a box breath, which literally will calm down your parasympathetic nervous system. Um, I really just, I, I, I believe that is, that is a way, it is the way for me, but that there, there are these ways that we, can, we know work that can help to heal our bodies and then that can help to heal our spirits and that can help to heal our relationships and that can help to heal our relationship with the planet. Thank you, Joisha. I, if I could, I would like to add one thought on this question because I, I think that for me, part of it is thinking about bioregional governance and moving away from kind of issue silos and uh, working on, some people work on this issue, some people work on that issue and moving towards the scale of our bioregion and how do we govern it collectively um, and just aligning around strategies. And that's part of what this session tried to do is to create a framework to align around strategies that really will be transformative. Um, and we, we are at, at um, at the moment for a transition to um, our final segment with Michelle Ayazi, and it's just what um, Joyce was calling for. So I'll pass it on to Basima to introduce Michelle. Thanks, Eli, and welcome, Michelle, and hello, everyone, again. Um, so in the spirit of global solidarity and connecting with one another and our planet, we, um, and just to also ground sort of everything we've been taking in together during this time that we have spent last hour and a half together. We're inviting Michelle Ayazi, who is a Sufi meditation or Tamrakos instructor to help ground us, lead us in a short meditation um, to help us move through the rest of our day and into the rest of the session. So I'd like to invite Michelle to come on stage. And can you please mute yourself everybody so that, um, we only hear Michelle. Hi everyone, thank you so much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, Sufi meditation is a heart focused or a heart centered meditation practice. This is its hallmark. And that's because in Sufism, the heart is considered to be the center of our being, 
where we can access our innate and endowed knowledge and wisdom. So let's begin by finding a nice comfortable seat. If you're able to, please sit with both of your feet flat on the floor. Feel that connection with the earth and see if you can sit tall by gently lifting the crown of your head up toward the sky. Relax your forehead, soften your temples, your jaw, soften your shoulders down away from your ears. While maintaining a straight spine, see if you can soften the muscles through your back, soften your belly, your rib cage, your chest, so the breath can flow easily. And if you feel comfortable doing so, soften your eyelids and gently close your eyes. Let's take three cleansing breaths together as a group. So begin by exhaling all the used stale air from your lungs by breathing out of the mouth, empty completely. And then let's breathe in through the nose. And exhale out of the mouth. <sighs> Breathing in, lengthening the spine. Breathing out, relaxing the shoulders, softening the hips. Breathe in, draw the breath inward and downward. Exhale out of the mouth completely. And just continue to breathe at a pace which is comfortable for you in this moment. Breathing slowly and deeply in through the nose and out through the mouth. With each in-breath, just see if you can feel the life energy moving through you. And with each out-breath, out just allow a wave of relaxation to move through you. Feel a charge of life energy move through you as you breathe in, allowing a wave of softness, of relaxation to flow through you as you breathe out. Become aware of the temperature of the air that you're breathing, cool and soft and fresh as you breathe in, warm and heavy as you breathe out. Just invite in this softness, invite in this coolness, this freshness with your inhalations. And with each exhalation, just release the fatigue, release the fog, release the heaviness. Inviting in the softness, the stillness, the freshness. Breathing out the tension, the grief, the negativity the noise, just taking in lovingly what you need and just lovingly releasing anything that isn't serving you. Taking in what you need and releasing all the extras. Now gradually, Move your awareness from wherever it is to your heart, to your physical heart, right in the center of your chest. And to help you arrive there, I invite you to place your hands on your heart, one on top of the other, and just rest there. And begin to channel your breath to your heart, direct your breath to your heart. With every inhalation, just experience a sense of openness, of expansion, of spaciousness. And as you exhale, allowing a softness and moving closer to yourself. Breathing in, experiencing spaciousness, openness, expansion. Breathing out, softening and moving closer to yourself. And as you breathe, see if in your concentration, you can sense your heart beating or this very deep and delicate rhythmic pulse originating from your heart. Otherwise, just imagine this really loving, delicate rhythmic pulse originating from your heart. 
And just imagine this soothing, comforting, healing energy emanating from your heart, pulsing through your being. A warm, loving, healing energy emanating from within, pulsing through your being, filling your whole body. Just experience your whole being resonating with the same frequency. Imagine all of us together, all of our beings pulsing with the same frequency. This loving, healing, nourishing energy just moving through all of us, just allowing us to feel connected, energized, in harmony. And gradually guide your awareness back to yourself, back to your heart. And just rest in yourself for just a moment in silence and in stillness. Take a deep breath in through your nose. Open mouth, exhale, let it go. I invite you to tilt your chin down so that as you prepare to blink your eyes open, you will be the first person that you see. I'd like to thank you so much for um, being open to this meditation. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. Much respect, many blessings on your pathways towards justice and belonging. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, thank you, Michelle. I needed that. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Wonderful to see you all.